My first guest tonight is actually a group uh, called Gary Wright and Wonder Wheel. And they're going to do a song written by Mr. Wright himself called Two-Faced Man. Will you welcome, please, Gary Wright and Wonder Wheel and Friend. I guess everyone knows by now that you're Gary Wright. Right. <laughs> Where do you know Gary Wright and his group from? 
Uh, from England. He yeah. used to be in a band called Spooky Tooth. Uh, I met him during my album, All Things Must Pass. Yeah. He came, played piano on the whole album. Mm -hmm. So I returned the favor tonight. Very nice. Uh, how many in the audience knew that, that George was in the group up there? Who, who, how many didn't know? I'm not in the group. Just no, no, I meant that now. you were up. I meant that did they recognize yeah. you there or not in that subtle the way we had you camouflage, bending in with the background like that. You know, I haven't, uh, you're only the second member of your former organization that I've ever met. Um, I, uh, I know John. You didn't meet the other eight. No, no. <laughs> Were there that many? Yeah, no, I, hundreds. I, I only, uh, I, I know you John. You of the 18th Beatle? Are there, there were rumors that the Beatles were not always the same person. In fact, no. they, there was once a rumor that there wasn't even the real four of you who came over here on one trip, that they just sent four We just sent four dummies out there. <laughs> that and, uh, what was the other one? Oh, that you uh, actually were all bald and that uh, yeah. had no hair and that you would, yeah. um, that was so you could go out in the street and not it's be recognized. truth. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, well, then they aren't let's rumors. Just, let's take a little march through time. It's bird's eye frozen orange. Plus, well, he's he's right. Uh, you weren't supposed to see that. Let's do take a little you march through miss time. Couldn't really, did you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you're well, lucky. It's that's right. It's eye. in three places. Um, with bird's eye frozen orange plus. If you like, well. Which one am I supposed to look? Now, now we're ah. here. Ah. Is this confusing you a little bit? It this is setup? all these cameras. Don't yeah. know which one I'm supposed to be looking at. It must be exciting for you to be next to a famous person. It is. It's very <laughs> exciting. I don't do this every night, you know. No. I do, unfortunately. Uh, no, I was, you were probably wondering what we were looking at. George saw the lights go on over the cameras, which gave me the lead into the commercial. Actually, I don't think the audience at home cares what we're looking at. I mean, they're more interested in, in what we well, think. Well, I want to know who, what's looking at me, really. You know, yeah. I'd like to check it out. Where it, there it is. You don't have to, they always say you don't have to worry about what camera's on, that they'll find you. Yes. That's, the, that's how I... Big Brother is watching you. <laughs> Whatever. Yoko sat in that very chair. Oh. <laughs> well, I bet many people have sat in this Well, a lot show. of people have sat in it, but I was just I thinking... saw the show, it was very nice. Very Did nice. you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Did... There was one thing they forgot to plug, so I thought I'd... <laughs> So I thought I'd plug it for them, and that's their new Christmas record. We wish you Merry Christmas. War is over. Get yours now. Thank you. Is there such a record? Yes, he made it after he was on the show, so he didn't get a chance to talk about it. Oh. Is there a slight undercurrent of hostility between you and uh, no, no, other members? No, no, really. Of no, you can John, tell me. I, mean, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not going to tell anybody. No, I, I just thought I'd take the opportunity and promote his record for him. Mm -hmm. War is over if you want it. Happy Christmas. Yeah. And Apple Records. Well, are, are you in any sense in contact with each other? Um, I mean, yeah, I saw him last night, actually, at the premiere of Raga, which what? is what we should talk about, maybe. Okay. <laughs> but, I mean, what did you say? Did I said, uh, hi, hello. <laughs> yeah. Do you have said, writers who think of these things, or yeah, do you just yeah. have them ready and you can just yeah. snap them right out yeah. like that? We have writers home. And, and Rooms what, full of them. <laughs> what did he come back with right away? With, hi. <laughs> yeah. Gee, this ought to be... Uh, was there more or did that well, just... No. Uh, that's pretty you've good. got real boring people, you know, to talk to on your show. I'm probably yeah. the biggest bore you've ever had on the show. Really? Mm. You think? Yeah. Well, I'll be the judge of oh. that. Listen, I'll tell you. Well, I don't really... You know, they asked me, do you want to come on the Dick Cavett show? And I said, uh, mm. yeah, i got nothing to talk about, really. Yeah. I said, well, think of something, you know, anything. So I thought, okay, we'll go and talk about Raga, which is... Uh... Film? Mm. Mm -hmm. You mean that's it? When we're done talking about that, then... Then I go. Then yeah. You don't like to talk, then? Well, not really. Sometimes, if there's something to say, but there's yeah. really nothing to say these days. <laughs> you know, I have that feeling, too. People think that I must love to talk and that I would love to go to parties and yak my head off and... I could go for months without talking. Well, you talk every night, don't you? I know, and I, I've never liked it. I mean, I've never, I don't crave conversation. I could sit in an empty room for days and, and days. I'd have to leave occasionally, but not to talk. I mean, yeah. I would, I, I don't, I have to fill in this you, last you, hour. You just talk and I'll watch. <laughs> 
Okay, well, we, we will. Let, let's do talk about the film. And then, um, well, before we get to yeah, that, though, since we, we may run out. Let's get to something else. When you, uh, if you and, you and John and Yoko do meet, though, you're not really no, no. gritting your teeth. No, no, and, we're good friends. Yeah. Well, all of that about her being the problem with the group, is that slightly silly that, that a one woman could be so much of a problem? No, the group had problems long before Yoko came along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Many problems, so it's... Can you remember who was the first to say, you know, I bet we'll break up one day, um, that this won't go on, that this is sort of a dream, that we can't all stick no. together? No. Uh, I don't really remember anything about the Beatle days. Uh, it seems like a sort of, you know, previous incarnation when I think about it. And a long time ago, like yeah. another life. Yeah. Yeah. Do you regret any of it? No, no. Don't regret really anything, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what happened and it was good, you know, it was good, but it was also good to carry on, do something else. In fact, it was a relief. <laughs> Sometimes they say you... Were, I mean, some you people were... can't understand that, you know, because Beatles was such a big deal. They can't understand why we should uh, actually enjoy splitting up. But there's a time, you know, there's a time when people grow up and they leave home or whatever they do, and they go for a change, you know, and it was really time for a change. Don't you think a lot of people just envied the idea of being world celebrities, though? And being well, there? some people, you know, would go on and on forever, singing the same tune and playing mm -hmm. the same gig if they were making some money, you know? Yeah. But uh, I think we'd all rather give that up and try going on our own and try doing something we really want to do. Mm -hmm. And if we don't make it, then hard luck. But uh, as it happens, we've all got such a lot of, like, goodwill hanging over from being Beatles. Yeah. I mean, you probably wouldn't have me on the show if I hadn't have been one. <laughs> Let's face it. No, you wouldn't get here on looks alone. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, uh, we will return after they, this message. Oh, now, wait a minute. station. <laughs> Just because that comes on doesn't mean you have to do it right away. Oh. Do you feel like doing it now? I just did it. Oh, right. Oh, I see. Four or five minutes. We will. <laughs> Four and five. He's right, folks. We will return after this message from our local station. See when you say it for me. Yeah. Talking with George Harrison, who wants to know if it's over yet. <laughs> uh, th th do you think you might have been the most anxious of the four to get out? I get that impression from reading about it. Uh, maybe, about maybe, yeah. yeah. I wonder it was why. Very, well, because um, over the uh, years, you know, I had such a lot of songs mounting up that I really wanted to do, but I only got my quota of one or two tunes per album. Mm -hmm. And uh, that way I would have had to have recorded about a hundred Beatle albums just to get out the tunes I had in 1965. Were you held down by the other fellas? Uh, well, very subtly, yes. Yeah? How would they not do really, it? I mean, they just... didn't strap me down or anything like that. Yeah. But, um, no, it was just the way things happened, you know. They, mm -hmm. It started off I didn't write, they wrote, then I started to write, and mm -hmm. it was uh, sort of trying to push in a bit. You don't, you don't actually read or write music, do you? No. Well, then how, when you say write... Well, write. If you have a tune that hits you, uh, how do you get it down? Just keep it in your head, you know, just mm. work it out on the piano or on the guitar. But then do you tape it or what preserves sometimes, it? Sometimes, sometimes, mm -hmm. put it on tape, but usually you can remember it in your head if you don't. I mean, I write the words down and remember the tune in my head. Yeah. Do you wish you'd studied composition and no. all of that? You don't need it? Well, I, maybe, uh, maybe it would help somewhere. I probably wouldn't have to uh, pay a copyist. But you don't miss it. I mean, you can... No, no. It's, it would just help. Maybe because it's not really or... sort of music, you know. Yeah. It's like... Uh, I mean, there's a difference between people who write music and classical things and big arrangements to the sort of thing I do. It's just really... It's very simple. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other guys, most of the melodies were, were John's or Paul's that were done... Um, yeah. Uh, done on the album. Um, that was funny when John was on. Every time we had a commercial break and then came back part 20 and they keep playing Paul's songs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Just put our guests at ease, I guess, yeah. is what, what we do. Uh, but they, they always talk about you as the real musician of the group. And if you yeah. haven't studied music, do, what do they mean by that? Do, that you're more serious about music? You've seen that, know. though, haven't you? That they it's say... probably because I didn't smile so much. <laughs> 
to be a real musician, you have to be sour, I suppose. Yeah. It's kind of, there was also the theory that you attracted more girls by being the quiet one, in the same sense that a guy at a party who sits in the corner uh, will have the girl come over and say, oh, what's the matter? It's you just... Know, uh, this was not a calculated... Dirty rumor. ...philosophy on your part. Was it? Just a rumor, yeah. Yeah. I think Paul used to get them all with his, you know... <laughs> Uh, do nerves hit you oh, yeah, badly? Oh, yeah, terrible. Yeah. Sometimes I sit down, like before the show, and try and figure out what it is inside that starts all this tension. Where's it coming from? I don't know, no idea. Otherwise, I could control it. They used to say that's a way to get rid of tension, is if you can try to sit down and think exactly where it where is. Is it in your from? stomach? Or what gives you that wave no, through the stomach? it comes from everywhere all at the same time. That's mm -hmm. the problem. You can't sort of, it's sort of abstract somehow nerves. The, well, the, the way nerves act upon you. Yeah. Does any kind of meditation uh, help before? Uh, yes, but I mean, that's a sort of different thing, you know, to this. I mean, you can't, uh, you could meditate and get peaceful, but mm -hmm. then the moment they say, the Dick Cabbage Show, <laughs> and then there you are again. <laughs> <laughs> so. Does this happen when you're watching the show or just when you're. Yeah. It, yes, it yeah. does. Just thinking about it, you know. I didn't know. I've probably, I've probably given you the beginnings of an ulcer. Uh, yes. So, you wouldn't use meditation as a tool to calming you down uh, as the most important thing. I think that's why some oh, people go into it, though. They yes, just say, I've yeah. tried everything, I take tablets. I, I mean, maybe I'm anything. more calm now than I would have been a few years ago, I don't know. But it's mm. still, uh, there's still something about the idea of this, you know, big brother and all them people tuned in. Okay, what's he going to say? Yeah. yeah. Look at <laughs> and so, you know, you don't... Oh, we have to take a station break. And what? A and what else? And sell some more oranges. No, re <laughs> no, read the whole thing. And we'll be back. That's the important part. Tomorrow night, my guest will be Danny Kay. That was Jack Benny. Could you tell that? Could you tell that I was doing Jack Benny? No. Oh, I know. <laughs> But, uh, but seriously, Jack Benny. they've oh, never well, heard of Jack better. Benny in England. You're kidding. When Jack Benny goes to the, they throw themselves at Jack Benny in England. Oh yeah, he goes to the Palladium, oh. and people just tear the place apart. Really? Oh yeah. Jack oh, Benny. Fancy that. Yep. <laughs> you'll, you'll learn a lot here with me. Uh, we have a piece of film here, uh, and I, I'm anxious to see it because I didn't get to go to that concert, but I I heard all about <laughs> it. Um, They're really ahead of us, aren't they? Uh, it's supposed to be one of the best things ever done of this kind, and uh, one of the most successful charity uh, things of this kind that anybody ever put together. And did you get the idea just sitting alone one day, or how did it come to you? Um, it came, really, it was Ravi Shankar's idea. Mm -hmm. He wanted to do something like this, and he was talking to me and telling me about his concern for the thing and asking me, if I had any suggestions, then after half an hour he talked me into being on the show. And so I, once I decided I was going to go on t onto the show, then um, that was it. You know, I just had to try and get a band together and set up. I organized the things with a little help from my friends from Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it. It just snowballed and the whole thing was thought of. and planned and executed all within about four weeks. Yeah. And it raised an enormous amount of money. And now, what, the thing that always bothered me was, how do you know that the victims of the problems in India and in Pakistan will mm. get the money that uh, you raise at a thing like that? Where, where does it go? Once it goes into the Madison Square Garden box well, office, then yeah. how does it get to the people that you see starving? Well, there was, um, because this concert was done with such short time for preparation, also because um, so many of these concerts were rip-offs. We wanted yeah. to ensure that we could do the concert and nobody would think that we were keeping the money ourselves. So there was such a short time, there was only like three weeks by the time we'd uh, more or less decided the concert was going on and then we had the, the date set for Madison Square Garden, which was like the only available day that we had. Uh, mm -hmm. So we decided the best thing would be to to give the money and say out front that this money is going to such and such a charity and then we check different things out 
we're going to give it to the Red Cross. This was the first idea. Mm -hmm. We give the money to the American Red Cross, who in turn could give it to the Indian Red Cross, but then we heard so many different stories about the Red Cross and how there's, you know, hurricanes hit some place in America and they just take care of the whites and all the blacks are there and they're not taking care of them. So you hear so many different stories about things. I hadn't heard that. Well, we heard so many stories about all different organizations. In the end, we had to really say what we were going to give the money to. So we said, we'll give the money to UNICEF and they have to say to us exactly what they need and they can come to us and say we need this and this and this and then we'll sign the check mm -hmm. and, and let them buy the things they need. So the concert made uh, $250,000 which actually is really very small in terms of the amount of money we're going to make from the record. The record and probably the film. But the record, uh, for the record, I'm hoping when we've realized some of the money, which should be around January, if the record comes out at all this year, that's another problem we're having, a slight problem with a uh, record company. Mm -hmm. But uh, if the record does come out early December, by mid-January, we should have realized quite a lot of money, yeah. a few million dollars. At that time, Ravi was going to be in... Uh, India, so I was going to go out there, get the money into India, and then I'll take it there myself, because I don't want the money to get lost. It's taken, you know, three or four months' work to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't want the money to end up in somebody's pocket. Yeah. I you guess you've had it. I haven't seen this bit of film, but I know this is the concert that people saw pictures of in the magazines. Bob Dylan showed up as a surprise, mm -hmm. at least to the audience, and um, and all. Uh, well, let's just it was take a surprise to me. Too. Was it really a surprise? Yes. Yeah. Let's take a look at uh, this from that night at Madison Square Garden. I was wondering where you went then. You sort of went off very fast. Yeah, I was going back to the hotel. Yeah. Uh, will you do that kind of thing again, do you think? Um, it seems like a very good idea. Yeah, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I, th I thought that, um, you see, it's difficult for... Not all musicians are rich enough through record sales or such like mm -hmm. to be able to donate their services all the time. So I yeah. figured a good way to do it would be maybe two concerts in each town, like similar to Madison Square. But first show, we keep the money, and the second show, we give the money to the charity. And that way we can feed the starving musicians, mm -hmm. and the second, we can feed the people. Yeah. I think I that mean, sounds... They, they criticize rock groups for being over-commercialized on the one hand, and yet the members of them are supposedly socially conscious on the other hand. So it seems like this is a wonderful way of combining mm -hmm. those two things, if you can draw a lot of money. Yeah. ridiculous sums by the average person's yeah. reckoning uh, then why not do it this way there must be loophole there must be other problems are, are there is the government suspicious of anything that is passed off I don't because think so because you say there have been rip off concerts yeah. so, I uh, think um, if you take sort of precautions mm -hmm. which is really uh, when we said we'd give the money to UNICEF for the concert that was really a precaution you know because yeah. too many things could have gone wrong and it would have been terrible to have done the concert and for it to turn out really bad. You know, so many concerts mm -hmm. turn out bad, like I think the Stones did, you know, and people getting killed and, Ultimate. you know, it's really bad, you know. So yeah. it's very important, I think, for something to come out really good, that feels good and, you know, the people that actually does something, you know. Yeah, yeah. Glad it turned out so well. Another one of those little messages. We'll be back right after this one. The Strata Lounger Lowback, the living room chair that's got everything. Looks, superb styling, marvelous comfort. Well, now this isn't one, actually. Don't, don't try to go back in this one. This is not a, not a Strata Lounger. Uh, we were talking during the break, and uh, George said that he had all... So the Red Cross shouldn't get too upset. Uh, he had said that you, he had heard bad things about all organizations and good things, and that it just became very hard to know which is which, and, yeah. and that that's one of the things that makes it hard to do this. So uh, um, the Red Cross should not feel particularly singled out. Um, Right? Right. Oh, okay. I mean, that's uh, just what I heard, you know. I mean, yeah. I've heard things about everybody, about you. <laughs> I've heard a lot about a... you. Oh, uh, no. well, it's only a 90-minute show. We won't have time to go into that. What have you heard? No, whatever you, whatever you try to do, 
yeah. you know, somebody would say, don't give it to the Red Cross, give it to them. So you say, okay, we'll give it to them. And then somebody writes saying, don't give it to them. You know, they're terrible. Yeah, every, every move you make, in the yeah. end, you know, I, I just think, well, maybe we shouldn't do anything. You know, really, I mean, that's the easiest thing would just to Same be to place. sit at home and not try and do anything for anybody. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's funny because uh, that's the situation. You know, you can create some money, then you've got the problem of who to give it to. If you can give it to somebody, then you have to worry about if they're going to get it. And mm. like, it's the same with the record, you know, all these musicians came. Some of them flew thousands of miles, didn't get paid for anything. Yeah. They came and did the show all out of the kindness of their hearts. Then I spent a, a month with uh, Phil Spector, uh, produced the record, you know, in a studio till like seven in the morning, making this record, getting the package together. And we get that ready. And we give it to the record company. And they say, now, how much are we going to make? So, no, you don't make anything. You know, mm. we make it. It's for the refugees, you know, and they say, well, you know, they don't want to do it for cost. We want them to do it for what it costs to manufacture. Actually, we've paid the cost so far. Yeah. Our company's paid for all the boxes, thousands, millions of boxes and things, you know, books that go with it. Then we give it to them on a plate and they want more money. And it's really not on, you know. It's really unfair. But what about Apple? They 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 well, do? Apple, that's our company. We've paid... Mm. Uh, so far, we, the, all the costs to make the record, to make the box, make the package, all the expense involved in the show. And then Capital, whose uh, Apple has a contract with to, uh, to distribute. Mm -hmm. They just have a, this distribution deal. So we're giving it to them saying, aren't you lucky, you know, you're the company who's, who's going to distribute this wonderful record. And they say, no, no, we want this money, that's not enough, we want that. And because they've lost so much bread, you know, they just really lost and they kicked all the staff out, fired everybody, brought in a new guy from, who was working in England, he was really from India, good old Baska Menon. And Baska happens to be from India, and I thought really at first he was really into the whole idea of it. But, you know, it's just been held up. This record should have been out a month ago, really. But now, we still haven't solve the problem. It will come out But we've got Dylan, you know, Dylan is CBS and, you know, they're cool about it and we've got Shelter and Electra and all different record companies have all, you know, said, okay, right, you know, put it out. And so the problem is with our distributor. You'll get it out. Then. We'll get it out. Yeah. I mean, I'll just put it out, you know, put it out with CBS and let, you know, Basco have to sue me. Basco Mammon. <laughs> We're going to play the sue me, sue you That's right, blues. Basker, sue him. Sue me, Basker. <laughs> Let me ask you, this tremendous... Uh, uh, George. George. Uh, <laughs> television in America isn't as mature as it is in England. No, it's very good in England, things. yeah. I uh, can't watch the, TV in America, to tell you the truth. It's such a load of rubbish. <laughs> Not the Dick Cabbage show, of Oh, course. oh, I, I wondered. No, I... It just drives you crazy, you know, the, the commercials. You just get into something and it's sorry now, another word from... Mm -hmm. And another word from... And in the end, you know, they just put commercials on all the time. But you have commercials too over on your side Yeah, of but it's really done good, you know. It's really done good. They show maybe... If, a, if it's a 30-minute show... They'll have the commercial at the beginning, then the show will start, and after 15 minutes or so, they'll, yeah. it'll end, and they say, end of part one, ding, and then it goes into the commercial, and then the commercials end, and it says part two. Here it just goes, ding, 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 from one into the next. Yeah. You don't know if it's a commercial or if it's the show. <laughs> I mean, it does some well, of the things. Let's say there are a lot of commercials. I'll, I'll give you that. I have a serious question I want to ask you, and I have a feeling we're going to get interrupted before I get to. But I've always, I, meant, I meant to get into this with John and with you. Have you ever seen Monty Python's Flying Circus? Yes. 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 Well, Very good. You want to get that on in America. It's really good. I thought of trying to get some of that into, and yeah. showing it. You um, try and get some. There clips. wasn't that. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah. Let me. Can I get to my serious question? Yeah. You have this tremendous influence, and you all, you had when you were together. You had this gigantic influence on the young people, right? Uh, and everybody knows that the Beatles went through a drug phase. Did it ever occur to you, or did you ever stop and think of it this way, that the fact that this was known, and the fact that you were the Beatles, 
might have caused thousands of kids to go into drug problems that might not have otherwise? Uh, well, no, no. Let him Shut ask up, the question. Let him ask the question. First of all, uh, when we took the notorious wonder drug LSD, yeah. it was uh, we didn't know we were having it. John and I had the had this drug, and it was given. We were at, having dinner with our dentist, yeah. <laughs> and he put it in our coffee and never told us. And we'd never, we never heard of it. I mean, it's a good job we hadn't heard of it because there's been so much uh, paranoia uh, created around the drug that people yeah. now, if they take it, they're already on a bad trip before they start. Yeah. Whereas for us, we didn't know anything. We were so naive. And uh, so we had it and we went out to a club and it was incredible. It was really <laughs> incredible. <laughs> so a couple of years later, Paul had the drug too. And the TV people in England came and they said, so you've had this wonder drug LSD. And he was saying, well, look, it's, you know, th the question you asked me about the responsibility for everybody else, Paul said to the TV people, look, I'm not saying if I had the drug, it, it's you. If you're going to ask me if I've had it, I'm going to say yes because I've had it. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. So he said, uh, they said, well, have you had LSD? And before they asked, he said, it's your responsibility because if you're going to ask me and I'm going to say yes and you're going to put it on the TV saying, mm -hmm. yes, we've had LSD. So really it was, the, it was their fault. So they asked the question, Paul said yes. And then they put it on and said, oh, they've had LSD. And then the world goes crazy. Yeah. I just wondered if, you're, you know, if you have to stop and think about it. You used the word responsibility, which is, uh, always sounds so hokey when your school teacher says, you have a tremendous responsibility. You know? <clears throat> but did, did, you ever say, did you ever take that kind of thing seriously and think, you know, we've got to watch ourselves because if we do this, other people will do that? Yeah, we always had to watch ourselves. Yeah. Uh, because if we weren't watching ourselves, there was somebody else out there who was. Yeah. And there was always uh, reporters who would follow us around on tour and always try breaking into our room, catching us doing something. Yeah. You know, something maybe that we shouldn't have been doing. And uh, the whole thing is that people want other people to do nasty things because yeah. they feed off it. And then they write, ha. Ah, they're doing nasty things. It's yeah. like in uh, a, a newspaper in England. I met David Frost the other day. Can I say David Frost or do you bleep it out? Once. Okay. <laughs> I bumped into him in the hotel and he said, here, to really bring you down is a copy of the News of the World. He'd just come from England. He bought yeah. this paper and there's a big story on the front saying... That's the scandal sheet. In yeah. yeah. But it's a big story saying about this group called the Marmalade, how they had orgies with their teenage fans and mm -hmm. all this sort of thing. But the whole idea of these reporters going out for months and months, scraping around, you know, lifting up the pavement, trying to see what rubbish there is to write about. And then yeah. they write about it as if they're saints and as if uh, everybody isn't count. doing it. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know where the responsibility... I mean, maybe you just should stay at home and never say anything. Mm -hmm. That's definitely the easiest. Or why do people do things just because famous, famous people do them is another question okay. I've never been able to figure out exactly. Um, Anyway, well, let's call the show. Here's a, here's a happy thought for the holidays from Singa. We only have a few minutes here. Uh, let me ask you one other thing, George, because it, it's a. Do you have any thoughts on on why hard drugs and rock stars are have become synonymous? I mean, you can see why if you had a life like Bessie Smith had or um, Billie Holiday or something like that, whatever they what they went through. If I were them, I suppose I would take anything that was available. But, I mean, yeah. most of the people in rock haven't had that dismal, grinding, horrible kind of life that... Uh, is it in any way a way of emulating those other people who, who were... Uh, well... Like those uh, There's a lot of, you know, I mean, a lot of pop people go through a hell of a lot, you know. Just say in one year they go, they see so much and they get, they go through yeah. so, so many different things that uh, they either just want to get high. I mean, basically, it starts <clears throat> with people who just want to get high, you know, like people drink. I mean, that's mm. a big problem. People get, have a drink, like I suppose after the show, maybe you have a drink, just to get a little high. Mm. So musicians, you know, either drink a little bit or maybe they smoke a bit, and then they want to get a bit high, you know, and, they, and they're sort of really looking for something. Mm -hmm. 
And it's the same with all those Bessie Smiths and all those people. Because the world is such a, a hard place to try and make it in. So, I mean, it, it, they're all just like buffers, all those drugs and things. And I suppose if they get on top of you, you know, they get next to you. And then you can't stop it. I don't know, the hard things. Are so That's what I wonder, like heroin. I mean, why that? Certainly, hardly anybody's been through anything like those people I mentioned, like Judy Holliday's, uh, Judy, uh, Be Be uh, hell, Billy Holliday's <laughs> life. So, uh, I, that, a life like that, I can see a, the really violent hard drugs, I suppose, because anything might be better than what they're going through. But unless you're to the point where you can say, I am just in the fires of hell all day, you know, day and night. Um, why, uh, the, the ones who've killed themselves, your, your colleagues, why, why heroin? Well, that seems to be the big one. Yeah. I don't, uh, I'm really unqualified to talk about heroin because I've never taken it. Yeah. And uh, I really don't intend to. There's, uh, you know, I'm sure it's just, uh, it's probably just the best high, you know, that's what it's down to. It's the one that gets them the highest, the quickest. But it just happens to kill you faster as well. I mean, they all sort of kill you in one way or another. And there's very few people who seem to be able to experience something like heroin and then get away from it. Mm -hmm. Because it just gets in the system and uh, they become dependent on it. I don't know. It's sad, you know, it's really sad because they're all looking for some deep love or something like that. And uh, they, they miss it, you know. It's much better to... Uh, try and not take any drugs, you know, if you can uh, get straight, <laughs> uh, really straight, then in a way it's much higher. I mean, I'm not really qualified to talk about that either. Yeah. I mean, I'm <laughs> well, real sort of in the middle, you know. Yeah. Indian music and drugs don't mix, as I understand it. Uh, no, there's been a big... Uh, said, so. Yeah. There was a problem, you know, the Indian music really got popular during that 66, 67, you know, all the psychedelic period. And uh, I think uh, from that most people have started to associate it with drugs because the hippies, apart from the classical people who used to go and watch the music anyway, like yeah. the hippie people at that time were the ones who caught on to Indian music and it just happens that most of them were, you know, like smoking pot or something. And since then, you know, I don't know, maybe Ravi will be able to explain how the two got caught up together, but it's really mm -hmm. a problem. It's a problem for Ravi because he's, uh, you know, trying to do this, spent years and years of real disciplined life in order to play this music, and then people think, oh, you know, he must, must have taken dope to play that good. You know, and it's really, it's, uh, it's, it's a terrible thing, you know, when somebody's... Uh, it's completely the opposite. The audience are really misunderstanding what the whole thing's about. Well, maybe we can get him to talk about that. Yeah. If we don't go now, we won't have time. We have a message from our local stations, and uh, we'll have time. He'll play, and then he'll talk. I suppose if any of us know anything about Indian music, it is uh, you have to say that Ravi Shankar has been sort of our guru to American audiences with his uh, frequent concerts and uh, film scores and so on. An amazing musician, Ravi Shankar.
champions from our local stations. This is Ravi Shankar. This is George Harrison. Uh, before you came out, George was saying, I don't know if you could hear it back there because you were sitting in place, uh, that people often think that um, uh, there must be an intimate connection between Indian music and drugs, maybe because of the bizarre sound, and that to play that way, uh, or to appreciate it at least, uh, there should be a drug connection. He said that that's not what but... you call him bizarre, Dick. <laughs> yes, I object to that word bizarre. Or not, I meant B A Z A A R, the other. Uh, no, wait a minute. There's no way I can get out of this. To Western ears, the unusual sound uh, might suggest um, some sort of chemical intoxication. No, I don't think it doesn't suggest anything. It has been somehow established from the very beginning. And I'm not blaming George, but you know, somehow. Because of him, the jo uh, the sita became really popular among mm -hmm. the young people and among many uh, rock groups. And it was because of the association of those rock groups, you see, mm -hmm. the kids took it for granted from the very beginning that, you know, it's something like rock music, yeah. you see. And then there happened to be people like Timothy Leary and Alan Ginsberg, you know, who some, somehow also established that Indian music is uh, associated with drugs and things like that. So it all connected and that's how it came. That's why you see in some of these films when they show any scene with an orgy or, or some, you know, pot party, pot party, party, you hear this bizarre sound of sitar, which yes. is bizarre because... <laughs> to, 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 the, to the Western ear. Yeah, but that's really bizarre because the sound you hear is not the real sound of sitar. It's somehow, mm -hmm. you know, played badly, some low string sitar it's played electronic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I think you'd have to be a... a, a, you have a you'd have to have an unusually clear mind to be able to do the... Absolutely. 17 parts of the instrument that have to be, uh, you have to be thinking about all at that's, once. That's true, you see, that's why I request my listeners to be in a clear mind, because I like to put them, you know, make them high. Yourself? With music. <laughs> yes, yeah. and I feel rather cheated when they're already high. What, the <laughs> what goes on at these raga classes of yours? Well, you see, actually our music is taught from person to person, like... Mm -hmm. From the guru teaches his disciple. It's a very personal thing. It's like... Is it shisha or what is the word for the student? Shishya. Shishya. Okay. That's the Sanskrit. Because there's the guru and the shisha. Right. Okay. My God, you know that. Right. Two <laughs> words is... <laughs> I'm going fast. So, so, you see, that's the personal. But we are trying uh, to also establish these classes mm -hmm. and taught as much as possible in the modern manner. But it was an actual guru only had one shisha probably at one time. You may, can you work with several at once because of the but, shortage of gurus? <laughs> well, it can happen, but it's mm. best when it is more personal, you know. Yeah. And it is uh, very difficult to... It depends upon this uh, shisha also, how serious he is and mm -hmm. whether he's learning it for just, you know, not really very seriously. Yeah. But... We have a piece of film that has taken at one of the classes, mm. and uh, let's take a look at that, and then um, that'll give us a better idea of what's, what was on there. Now, once more. One day Guru Deva, Jaya Jaya Guru Deva, Jaya Shri Guru Deva, Jaya Jaya Guru Deva. It is in praise of the Guru. One day means uh, not to hell, but hell, hell, H A I L. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
Ni de ga pa pa ga de. Ni de ga pa pa ga de. Ni de ga pa ni de de ni. Ni de. Ni de ga pa ni de de ni. Ni de ga pa ni de de ni. Re ni pa ga re ni pa. Re ni pa ga re ni pa. Ni de ga pa de. Ni de ga pa de. Ta 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 ding ta ta ta. One two three one two one two three one two one two one two. It's so open and warm with these young people. They're so fresh, so much energy. But so many seem to be turning away from their roots. Here they have everything, and they want something else. They love our music, but they are in such a hurry. I would like to give them the right approach. The second that the, uh, the second the film came on, Mr. Shankar said, "That's wrong." Uh, what did you mean? <laughs> no, this was not actually class. This was uh, mm -hmm. George was also there in Aslan Foundation, you know, uh -huh. in Big Sur. That was obviously not so you with the students. Sort of or? a semi-class, but not actually a class of sitar. Yes. I misrepresented that. We'll be right back <laughs> after this message from our local state. I should have mentioned that, that we got that piece of film from a long film uh, called Raga, which does show you working with students. And George said it was really interesting to see the several sitars trying to play the same piece, uh, yeah. the same passage, I suppose, over. Yeah. Uh, is Raga um, around now where anybody can see it? Yes, it's just concertos with the symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. The next one is in Detroit, which will be on the third, and one in Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo. And on the seventh. On Friday, Carnegie Hall. And Friday, I'm performing this Friday uh, in Carnegie Hall. That is sitar recital. Mm -hmm. How do we get George to perform again someday? How do you mean? He will. Oh, well, <laughs> well, I mean, no, he's not going to. There's no time to he, perform. You'll what? be appearing in public. Uh, perform the the act of music. Um, <laughs> Oh, well, that's easy, you know. Yeah. When you get everything arranged, would you ever consider... If I ever a get a minute free, I may just do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, too busy we're... working. Yeah. Really? What, what's keeping you too busy? All this editing films and, um, you know, just uh, since June, I have had really very little time. So we did that concert, then we did the uh, mixing of the record, mm -hmm. then we did the film editing the film and that's still going on now like this morning I was down there just stuck in a room looking at bits of footage everybody ends up editing film whatever else they started out at they all end up editing film yes have you noticed that <laughs> one of those conversation stoppers no I haven't <laughs> but every time I call on someone uh, they're, they're busy editing, editing film, film. yes yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't have time to see the Indian dance clip, which I wish we had seen. Come back some time, and uh, we'll take a look at that and talk about that, that some more. Does it ever bother you that the sitar, which is sort of, a, in a sense, sacred instrument, is, um, is carted around and appears in all sorts of commercial concerts? It can, but sitar mainly is a classical instrument, just like mm -hmm. the place of violin in the Western classical music. But it can be used for, you know, it's played in semi-classical music as well as pop music in India which is the film music. But it would be bad taste, say, to play turkey in the straw on a, on a sitar, I suppose. So I saw you carrying it down the stairs, and you were carrying it so carefully. Do you live constantly in the fear of the terrible sound of a sitar dropping down a flight of stairs? <laughs> yes, I have to carry it all the time like a baby. I have to buy a ticket all the time on the plane. And You do? You carry it in the seat beside you on the yes, plane? And always. With a safety belt on it? <laughs> and always I'm... Um, by the hostesses, they always ask what it is, so I always tell them it's a dead body, so they keep away. <laughs> <laughs> we have a message, we'll be back. I know that neither of you likes to hustle things, so I'll just point out that the Bangladesh concert is on record, and so is your concerto, and the record with Andre Previn, and Raga is also on. Uh, there is a soundtrack album. This time has really flown. 
Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, no, let it sit. Yeah, can you get Raga. a good shot of those? Good shot, Raga. Don't wait. <laughs> at your record stores now. After what you said about the Lennons, well, I'll... Another... I learn a lot of things from the Lennons. I think... <laughs> I wish we had more time, you know. 